Church. Oh, it's so nice to see you guys out there. Uh, we've got a song to share with you this morning. Um, I just want to let you know the choir is, is fully vaccinated. Um, we're going to sing with our masks off, but I just want to let you know to hopefully ease any concern. We are fully vaccinated and feeling healthy today, and we want to share this song with you. So. dwells in the presence of God's people. Perfect for the service today. So thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Welcome this morning to Grace Congregational United Church of Christ. We are so glad that you are here with us today as we worship God together. For no matter who you are and wherever you are on life's journey, you are welcome here. 
I'd like to invite for the folks who have announcements this morning. And while they're coming up, I'll invite you to grab the friendship pads in the center of the pews, pass them on down, and know that after our service of worship, Next door in the fellowship hall is time after church. Uh, Betty Becker is hosting again. Um, you may not be aware, we have a sign-up sheet on the information desk for people to sign up for tack time um, for the next several weeks. There has not been anybody signed up for these last couple weeks, and Betty keeps stepping forward to, to offer hospitality for us. So thank you to Betty for doing that. Um, if you're interested in hosting tack time, you can sign yourself up. Uh, for uh, upcoming weeks. If you've never done it before and you want a little bit more information, um, talk to me, talk to Betty, talk to any of our church leaders. We're happy to, to help you um, know, you know a few things about uh, how to set up and what to do. Barbara. Okay. Good morning. I am here again to remind you about the Women of Grace um, annual chili drive through It will be November 13th from 11 until 2, that is a Packer game Sunday, so the Packers will be playing the Seattle Seahawks. If we run out of chili, it might be end before 2 o'clock, just so you know. You can purchase a bucket for $20 or a quart for $6. You can get your chili with or without noodles, and there will also be vegetarian chili for those of you who are vegetarians. The sign-up sheet for ordering your chili is on the information desk in the back. And remember our shut-ins. If you would like, please purchase a quart of chili for them, and it will be delivered to them. We'd like you to place your order for the chili before November 7th, because it takes a while to get all of these 18 Nescos full of chili ready. I can't even imagine. I'm going to be working with Annie this year to work on it. We also need people to help us make the chili. So there are sign-up sheets out there, too, approximately two hours in the morning and two to three hours in the afternoon. And um, if you have any questions, please contact Annie Clayman. Thank you, Thank Barbara. You. So just to clarify, it's helpful to order in advance. Yes, But please. even if you don't order in advance, you can show up that, sun, that Saturday and to get chili your until chances. you run out. Yeah, mm -hmm. until it runs out. And exactly. in previous years, they, you've sold out. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So right. okay. that's good. Thank Thanks. you, Barbara. Charlene. Good morning. My name is Charlene, and I'm here on behalf of the Sunday Supper. Um, the day following the chili Saturday, we will be doing the um, Sunday Supper at St. Peter the Fisherman. Um, we are asking for help. You start at about 4.15. You have to show up at St. Peter the Fisherman, um, and we're usually done by 6. There is a sign-up sheet at the information desk where we could use some cookies or bars or your help. Unfortunately, we had signed up for the Sunday long before the Packers schedule came out. It is a 325 Packer game, so I do think our attendance might be down, but we still do need your help and support. Thank you. Thank you, Charlene. Today in our service, we are doing our Remembrance Sunday, or Toten Fest, as we sometimes call it. And so um, I need some volunteers um, during the service. We, uh, as is our tradition here at Grace, we carry in a candle which, with each name that is read to remember the people who have died in the last year. Um, so these volunteers can be anybody, kids, teenagers, adults, um, anybody who, who can stand up and carry a candle forward to the table up here. Um, I need probably at least 15 or 20 people. You can go to the back during the singing of For All the Saints, our opening hymn, and there'll be some people back there to help, help line you up and tell you what to do. Um, but so I'm, I'm taking volunteers right now so that we can make sure we have enough people. So who is willing to help? Okay, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. Perfect, if any choir members want to join in too, you'd be welcome to. I don't think the choir is doing anything around that time. Um, so thank you for those who volunteered. If others want to too, you, you are welcome to join in. Um, like I said, meet in the, in the back in the gathering area during the first singing of For All the Saints, our opening hymn, and uh, there'll be people back there to help you and tell you what to do. Thank you. Let us now prepare our hearts, our minds, our bodies, and our souls for the worship of God. Oh 
Today is Remembrance Sunday. The reason why we are celebrating that today is because it happens every year, the Sunday closest to November 1st, which is All Saints Day. And so every year on Remembrance Day, we gather together as a community and lift up the names of those in our own church and in our wider lives who have died in the last year as we remember their love and the place they had in, their, in our lives. And so I want to share with you these words as our opening for worship today. These words are words that we begin every funeral service with. Whenever we have a funeral service here, these are the words that start our time together. Friends, we gather here in the protective shelter of God's healing love. We are free to pour out our grief, release our anger, face our emptiness, and know that God cares. We gather here as God's people, conscious of others who have died and of the frailty of our own existence here on this earth. We come to comfort and to support one another in our common loss. We gather to hear God's word of hope that can drive away our despair and move us to offer to God our praise. We gather to commend to God with thanksgiving the lives of the ones we have loved as we remember the good news of Christ's resurrection. For whether we live or whether we die, we belong to Christ, who is Lord of both the living and the dead. Amen. All of us know what it is like to grieve the loss of someone we hold dear. All of us know what it is like to mourn the death of someone we love. And yet, we feel a pressure to move on quickly, to carry on just as we had before, to return things back to normal. In the church, it does not have to be that way. Here is a place where we can acknowledge our pain, here is a place where we can admit our grief. Here is a place where we can lift up our pain before God and before one another. Here is a place where we can remember God's promise. Death will not have the final word.
may be seated. We remember the great ancestors of our faith, from Abraham and Sarah to Paul and Phoebe. Ancestors of the faith, we remember you. We remember the prophets and priests, the ministers and teachers who have taught us the way of God. Teachers of the faith, we remember you. We remember our grandparents and parents, aunts and uncles who have gone before us in our lifetime. Family of our faith, we remember you. We lift up the memories of children and grandchildren, siblings, spouses, and parents whose lives have ended too soon. Those close in our heart, we remember you. We lift up to you, O oh God, the names of those we have lost in this past year from our lives, knowing that they are with your heart forever. As we read these names, we take time to pray, remember, and give thanks for their lives. The Reverend Catherine Connor Okun, James Toddy, Judy Twinkle, Agnes Chris Avery, Carolyn Ringsmith Otterness, Michael David Walsh, Maxine Harris DeBryan, Dorothy LaCroix, Bob Chikowski, Wayne Junk, Florence Lecker, Roland Dvorak, Julie Mickler, Jean Krieger, Diane Sattler, Michael Boomgarden, Tammy Erdman, Mary Law, Kayla Corner, Richard Hirth, Carl Steger, the Reverend Dr. Dale Jean Cup, Randall Rabe, Donna Anderson, Wayne Henrik, Jean Sutter, Tori Crozer, Nancy Berkman, Erica Reichling Dosler, David Konitzer Sr., Roberta Ott, Joseph Donald Bonin, Keith Diedrich, Alice LeClaire, Mitt Kintoff, Sandy Gross, David Conitzer Jr., Lloyd Wirch, Lee Meyer, Debbie Ganey, Jean Doricher, Garth Bud Berendt, Bill Munka, Mary Jane Shonalitz, James Taylor, Kenny Bakeman, Nicole Kellner, Bill Rennert, Sandy Munka, Ryan Arnold, Harold Delmo, Dan Browers, Austin Funk, Mike Matthies, George Rarehauer, Lori Steck, Doris Wire, Joan Clayman, Lloyd Schmitz, Dr. Edwin Boat, Carol Crema, and Judith Lemke. We celebrate those, the lives of those we have named, O oh God, and lift up many more names in our hearts. Family of God, we remember you and we honor you. We know you are with us in this spirit of worship and you will not be forgotten. We give thanks, O oh God, for all who have gone on to join with you beyond this life. 
We trust in the hope of resurrection and the promise of new life in Christ. And know that our grief and celebration, O oh God, you are with us through it all, and we are not left alone. In the name of Christ, in whom love lives forever, we pray. Amen. Psalm 84 is a pilgrimage song. It would have been recited or sung as people were traveling to the temple in Jerusalem. The psalmist describes their desire to be this special place where God's glory can be seen and felt. Please pray with me. How lovely is your dwelling place, Lord of heavenly forces. My, My very, very being longs, longs even yearns, yearns for the Lord's courtyards. My heart and my body will rejoice out loud to the living God. Yes, yes the sparrow too has found a home there. The swallow has found herself a nest where she can lay her young beside your altars. Lord of heavenly forces, my King, my God. Those who live in your house are truly happy. They praise you constantly. Those who put their strength in you are truly happy. Pilgrimage is in their hearts. As they pass through the back of valley, they make it a spring of water. Yes, the early rain covers it with blessings. They go from strength to strength until they see the supreme God in Zion. Lord God of heavenly forces, hear my prayer. Listen closely, Jacob's God. Look at our shield, God. Pay close attention to the force of your anointed one. Better is a single day in your car courtyards than a thousand days elsewhere. I would prefer to stand outside the entrance of my God's house than live comfortably in the tents of the wicked. The Lord is a sun and a shield. God is favor and glory. The Lord gives, doesn't withhold good things to those who walk with integrity. Lord of heavenly forces, those who trust in you are truly happy. Good morning, and thank you, Rory. A reading from the Gospel, John 2, 13 through 22. The Passover of the Jews was near, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple he found people selling cattle, sheep, doves, and the money changers seated at their table. Making a whip of cords, he drove them, all of them, out of the temple, both the sheep and the cattle. He also 
poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. He told those who were selling the doves, take these things out of here. Stop making my father's house a marketplace. His disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. The Jews said to him, what sign can you show us for doing this? Jesus answered them, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it again. The Jews then said, this temple has been under construction for 46 years and will you raise it up in three days? But he was speaking of the temple of his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples remember that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. Blessing be to God's people. Thank you, Hal. I would like to invite forward any children who are present with us this morning. Come on up and join me up here, and while you're coming up, I'm going to move this out of our way just a little bit this morning. Good morning, good morning. Thank you for being here. That's for later. All right, so um, we have a special delivery for us this morning. Are you ready? Are you ready? Is that the postman? Not exactly, but somebody's bringing it in. Are you ready? Come on in. Oh, I know what it is. Well, hold on to that thought for just a second then, because then I will ask. All right, here it comes. If you guys want to just kind of turn sideways a little bit. There you go. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you much. All right. This is mine. What is this? It's, Do you know what it's, it's called? A, it's, a, it's the box where they put um, the um, Ten Commandments. Very good, very good. It is the box where they put the Ten Commandments in. Do you remember what they called the name of that box? Do you remember? Do you remember, Jason? Um, it's, box? That is an excellent guess. But it is called the Ark of the Covenant. Covenant means a promise, but like a special kind of promise that's kind of halfway between a promise and a contract. Um, a promise that God uh, gave the people to stay with them. So it's the Ark of of the covenant, the box that reminds them of God's promises. And so inside the Ark of the Covenant was um, the stone tablets that the Ten Commandments were written on, but they also kept a couple other little things in there. Um, there was a little, a few pieces of manna from when they were in the wilderness and God fed them with a special food called manna. They kept a few pieces of manna in the box and just a couple other things that reminded them of God. And they would carry it around with them, right? Just, just like we saw it carried in, it, the real Ark of the Covenant had these big long posts, a lot longer than these, and, uh, and people would carry it. It took a lot of people to carry the real one because this, one, this one's just kind of made of, you know, wood and cardboard and, and decorative paper. Is there anything in there? No, there, no, there's nothing in ours. Ours is just a reminder of it. So the real one would have been a lot heavier. Both the box itself would have been a lot heavier and there were big heavy things inside it, right? So, so it would have taken a lot more people to carry the real one. But just, but just like it was brought in here for us to see, the Israelites, the ancient people of Israel, would carry this box around with them to be a reminder that God was with them no matter where they went. Well, but the box, the box was important because it carried those important things, right? And even though it was heavy, it was a lot of work, I think that maybe that was part of how they showed that they were devoted to God because they were willing to put in that work. But you're right, it would have been hard. All right, will you guys pray with me? Let's pray. Dear God, we thank you for all the things that remind us that you are here with us. Help us to carry you in our hearts. 
to not ever get tired of your presence in our midst. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Want a treat? Before our service this morning, I um, neglected to mention one other announcement uh, that Pastor Bob asked me to mention. Um, he thanks the more than 50 people so far, members of this congregation who have uh, attended a cottage meeting thus far. There's just a couple more opportunities to do them in the next week or so if you have not yet attended a cottage meeting. There'll be one tonight over Zoom at 7.15, so if you'd like to get into that one, either let me know or send an email to Pastor Bob. Um, and then there is also one for our high schoolers, our youth and our teenagers um, on Wednesday night this week during the regular uh, youth group Gen G time. Uh, will be a cottage meeting just for the high schoolers and the youth. Our scripture today, is about Solomon, who is David's son. Last week, we met a young boy, David, uh, as he was anointed to be king, but was not yet king. A lot happens in his reign, and David, at first, is a good king, well-loved by God and well-loved by the people. And mostly that carries on um, throughout his reign, despite some some pretty bad mistakes and decisions that he makes, but he's, he's well-loved. Uh, after David, his son Solomon becomes king. Solomon is not strictly first in line, um, but is actually the fourth of David's sons. The other three before, uh, before Solomon end up engaging in some pretty bloody battles with one another. Um, and so eventually Solomon, fourth in line, becomes king. Uh, Solomon most famously was very wise. There's a story in the Bible where he asks God not for riches and not for a long life, but for wisdom so he can rule well and know right from wrong. And God comes to Solomon and says, because you have been humble enough to ask for wisdom, I will not only grant you wisdom, but I will grant you riches and long life too. And so he is well blessed by God. This is part of Solomon's story from 1 Kings chapter 5, verses 1 through 5, and then chapter 8, 1 through 13. Listen. For a word from God. Now King Haram of Tyre sent his servants to Solomon when he heard that they had anointed him king in place of his father, for Haram had always been a friend to David. Solomon sent word to Haram saying, you know that my father David could not build a house for the name of the Lord his God because of the warfare with which his enemies surrounded him until the Lord put them under the soles of his feet. But now the Lord my God has given me rest on every side. There is neither adversary nor misfortune. So I intend to build a house for the name of the Lord my God, as the Lord said to my father David, your son, whom I will set on the throne in your place, shall build the house for my name. Then Solomon assembled the elders of Israel and all the heads of the tribes, the leaders of the ancestral house of the Israelites, before King Solomon in Jerusalem, to bring up the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord out of the city of David, which is Zion. All of the people of Israel assembled to King Solomon at the festival in the month of Ethanim, which is the seventh month. And all the elders of Israel came, and the priests carried the Ark. So they brought up the ark of the Lord, the tent of meeting, and all the holy vessels that were in the tent. The priests and the Levites brought them up. King Solomon and all the congregation of Israel who had assembled before him were with him before the ark, sacrificing so many sheep and oxen that they could not be counted or numbered. 
Then the priest took the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord to its place in the inner sanctuary of the house, in the most holy place underneath the wings of the cherubim. For the cherubim spread out their wings over the place of the Ark so that the cherubim made a covering, place, a covering above the Ark and its poles. The poles were so long that the ends of the poles were seen from the holy place in front of the inner sanctuary, but they could not be seen from the outside. They are there to this day. There was nothing in the ark except the two tablets of stone that Moses had placed there at Horeb, where the Lord made a covenant with the Israelites when they came out of the land of Egypt. And when the priests came out of that holy place, a cloud filled the house of the Lord so that the priests could not stand to minister because of the cloud, for the glory of the Lord filled the house of the Lord. Then Solomon said, The Lord has said that he would dwell in thick darkness. I have built you an exalted house, a place for you to dwell forever. Will you pray with me? Holy God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight and bring you glory, for you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Hundreds of years before Solomon built a grand temple for God, the Israelite people were slaves in Egypt. We know the story. Moses is called by God to be their leader and brings them out of slavery and towards the promised land. But before they can go to the promised land, right after they are safely out from Egypt and have gotten into the wilderness, Moses leaves his brother Aaron in charge and goes up a mountain to talk to God. For 40 days, Moses is on the mountain. For 40 days, people are at the bottom of the mountain waiting. For 40 days, God talks directly with Moses. For 40 days, the people hear nothing from God and nothing from Moses. And so they start to get a little antsy. And in a desperate attempt to help people feel more connected to God, Aaron orchestrates the building of the golden calf. After 40 days away, Moses finally comes down the mountain, carrying in his hands those stone tablets that have the Ten Commandments on them. And Moses sees that in his absence, the people have built an idol, breaking both the first and the second commandments in one go. And Moses is furious. He takes the tablets, smashes them to pieces on the ground, and then takes the calf and grinds the gold into powder and mixes it with water, and in a truly bizarre move, gives it to the people to drink. Perhaps to show, look, this idol can be broken. It is not God. The people are punished further after this, but eventually Moses and God both talk each other down a bit and decide to forgive the Israelites. Another set of stone tablets with the Ten Commandments on them gets made, and the people follow very specific instructions from God to build a box that will be called the Ark of the Covenant, which they will use to store, to store and carry the tablets. And all through their time in the wilderness, it will be 40 years before the Israelites actually make it into the promised land, they carry this Ark of the Covenant with them. The Ark itself becomes a symbol and a reminder of God's presence with the people there in the wilderness. The people move all over the land, and wherever they go, they carry the Ark, and God's presence goes along with them. It had long poles attached for carrying, as I mentioned, but much longer than the ones we see here. Both because it was heavier 
than our box would and would take more people to carry it. And also because people could not get too close to the Ark of the Covenant. It seemed to have some kind of holy energy emanating from it. And if anyone got too close or mistreated the Ark of the Covenant, it was like they would be zapped by lightning. When it wasn't actively being carried, the Israelites placed the ark inside a special tent called the tabernacle. There was no temple, no church, no permanent structure of any kind for those 40 years in the wilderness, just a tent. God's presence was mobile among the people. By the time we get to King David, the Ark of the Covenant has been in hiding for a while. The Israelites were much more established by now in their homes and in their cities, and they had been for a few generations. They weren't traveling around and carrying God with them anymore. And the Ark had been put away because too many people had been careless with it and had gotten zapped. So at some point, King David realizes this is not right. We need to make God the center of our lives again. So in one of my favorite David stories, he brings the Ark of the Covenant out of hiding and parades it through the city of Jerusalem, dancing wildly behind it. The tabernacle tent is brought along with it, and still the Ark lives inside a tent. It is King David who first suggested to God that he might build God a temple. David himself was living in a pretty nice palace by this point. So why should God live in a tent? But God tells David, no, it will be your son who will build me a temple. And so today we read the fulfillment of what God has told David. As David's son and the next king, Solomon, is the one to complete a temple for God. And wow, was it majestic. Maddox, can you switch to the next slide for us to see the picture? This is a picture of what the temple might have looked like. You can see it's kind of cut in half. So you can see both the outside and the inside. The structure itself was huge especially for ancient standards, and both the outside and the inside were ornately decorated. The building itself, the furnishings, the decorations were all made from the finest materials. Gold, real gold, was everywhere. And unlike other temples that would have been found in neighboring nations, there were no statues, no images of any god. Instead, the art there depicted palm trees, flowers and cherubim or angels, reminders of God's creation. No expense was spared, and it took years of conscripted hard labor from the people to make Solomon's temple a reality. There were different sections of the temple, An outer area where anybody, including even Gentiles, could be. And then there were sections and chambers inside which were increasingly restrictive, with only certain groups and then subgroups and then subgroups from that able to journey farther into the heart of the temple. In the center of the temple was a place called the Holies, perhaps not unlike a sanctuary like this one. But the priests were the only one allow, ones allowed into the holies area. Beyond that, the deepest and most restrictive area was the holy of holies. And only the high priest was allowed there, and only once a year. Inside the holy of holies was the tabernacle, And inside the tabernacle was the Ark of the Covenant. And inside the Ark of the Covenant were those stone tablets with the Ten Commandments. God, of course, was not limited to the space of the temple. 
And even Solomon himself admitted that God was too big to be contained in any one place, especially one made by human hands. And yet, now finally, God had a permanent home and resting place among the people of Israel. There was one centralized place that they could travel when they wanted to gather as the people of God to praise and honor God. And yet, even within the temple's permanence, the Israelites chose to keep both the ark and the tabernacle tent, those symbols and reminders of their struggles in the wilderness, those transient times, the impermanence and fluidity that was an important piece of who they were as the people of God. It wasn't so long ago that we ourselves were without a temple, forced out of our sanctuary by the pandemic. We had to figure out how do we worship God without the holy space that reminds us of God's presence. How do we bring God with us out into this new wilderness in our lives? What will we carry as reminders of God's presence? For a while, in those early pandemic days, we pre-recorded worship services. And then we worshiped together outside in the parking lot. And then when it got too cold, we live streamed from inside. And then we moved back outside until finally we felt mostly safe coming back in here to a more normal state of worship. And through all of that, we in church leadership hope to offer for you to carry with you into that wilderness was God's word. God's word in scripture, in preaching, in hymns, and in songs. For us, the word of God is that symbol and reminder of God's presence with us in this world. And that was okay for us to help you have the word of God in worship in your own homes. It works when there aren't other options. But we all know it falls short at some point. There's something missed when we're not here in the church together. Yes, the God's word is our symbol of God's presence, but being with one another together as a community is just as important for how we experience and remember God's presence with us in this world. We are one another's reminders of God. And so, in order to be together, while we were still without a permanent home, we carried around our own version of arcs and tabernacles in the form of sound and video equipment, a pickup truck and a podium, a cross and a keyboard. We carried it all with us, inside and outside, to draw the community together and remind us all that God travels with us out into the wilderness. And while that time of carrying around our stuff was difficult and exhausting and stressful, there's something really powerful about the nearness of God when we're out in the wilderness. And now too, although we're no longer in tents, but have come back inside our permanent structure, we're still in a wilderness in some ways, aren't we? Still dealing with the pandemic and now also embarking on a search process. Not entirely sure what direction we'll be heading, trying to discern together what our future looks like as a community. There's a book called How to Lead When You Don't Know Where You're Going written by a church consultant named Susan Beaumont. And she talks about these liminal places where changes are happening, either changes for us directly or changes in the world around us that we then have to adapt to. And we try to figure out what to do and how to respond and where we're headed. But it's really a painful place 
that place of not being sure and that place of not knowing what happens next, it's a painful place for humans to be, to stay in it. We feel vulnerable and we don't like it. But Beaumont argues that it's in that place of not being sure, of feeling vulnerable and a little bit in pain, that we are actually closest to God. That just as God came to dwell right with the people in the wilderness in the biblical story, God comes to dwell right with us where in our wilderness places too. Once we say, yes, this is where we are going, our eyes go straight to that end point and we march there, so focused on where we're headed that we often miss the ways that God is journeying with us. So instead of trying to run out of this hard, unknown, liminal place as quickly as we can, perhaps instead we stay a while. Not forever, because stagnating in the wilderness is not a good place to be either. But instead of trying to run to that next thing right away, when we pause and we admit that we don't know where we're going, and we stay patient and face our vulnerability and pray for God's discernment and direction and help, that is exactly the place where God comes closest, right into our midst to dwell and to journey along with us. Will you pray with me? Holy God, we know that you are always near, but we admit that we don't always notice, we don't always feel it. Sometimes we are so busy that we don't take the time to step back and feel your presence. And sometimes we are so stressed and sometimes we are so lost in grief that we just can't feel you with us, God. But we remember your promise that you will be with us always and we ask us, we ask you to help us. Help us feel your, you with us and help us remind one another of your presence, of your love, of your grace in this world. We pray this morning for John and for Dorothy as they continue their recovery. And we pray for all those who are sick, God, we pray for Mandy, and we pray for so many others we know who are struggling for healing, who are struggling for comfort, who are struggling for calm and for wholeness. God, strengthen them in body and in spirit that they might continue to serve you and live the life that they want to live. God, we pray for all those who are grieving, for all the lives that we have lost in this last year. God, we are grateful for the ones who touch our hearts. And we can be so sad when they leave this world. But we know and we trust that they are in your presence. That whether we are living or whether we are dying, we belong to you, that you hold us in your hands. Help us remember that this world belongs to you, that we are not in control, and yet that we can rest in calm and in peace with the assurance of your promises. We know, God, that you hear all of our prayers. You will hear these ones that we have lifted aloud and these ones that we lift now from the silence of our hearts.
And now we join our voices together and pray to you, God, the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. As we continue our uh, stewardship time here at Grace Congregational Church, I'd like to invite for Jim Conitzer, one of our trustees, and Mark Schmidt. And um, I serve on the Board of Trustees here at Grace, and I'm also serving on the Stewardship Committee. A couple of weeks ago, October 17th, we kicked off our five-week stewardship campaign. I came up and talked to you, shared my story, and today, um, Mark Schmidt would like to share his story with us. So, Mark. Good morning, everybody. I hope, I really hope this doesn't come across as a fourth grade book report. Nothing wrong with fourth graders and nothing wrong with book reports, but I'm not a fourth grader and it's not a time for book reports. But I am reading a book. <clears throat> it's called The Book of Hope by Jane Goodall. And if you know who Jane is, uh, Jane Goodall is a researcher and a, a naturalist who has invested her life in understanding and working with um, chimpanzees in Eastern Africa. She's given her life to that. And in that, in that investment, she has found great hope. And in this book, this is kind of the book report part, in this book, she was asked a few questions, and I want to share with you how she responded. So the, interview, the interviewer asked her, aren't some people just more hopeful or more optimistic than others? Well, maybe, Jane said, but hope and optimism are not the same thing. Well, what's the difference? I haven't got the faintest idea, she said with a laugh. I waited, I waited, knowing Jane loved scientific inquiry and debate. I could see she was considering the difference. And here's what she said. Well, I guess either a person is or isn't an optimist. It's a disposition or a philosophy of life. As an optimist, you can just have the feeling, oh, it'll be okay, it'll be all right. It's the, opt it's the opposite of a pessimist who says it's never going to work. Hope, on the other hand, is a stubborn determination to do all you can to make it work. And hope is something we can cultivate. It can change over the course of our lifetime. Of course, someone with an optimistic nature is far more likely to be hopeful because they see a glass as half full rather than half empty. I don't know about you, but this morning, when I listened to the announcements before we began our worship, I found hope. Because if you listen to the announcements, they were all about giving life to others. I found hope this morning when 20 of you volunteered to bring in candles to remember during the litany uh, people that have passed before us. I found great hope in the young people that brought the Ark of the Covenant forward. I found hope in the innocence of the children that sat on the steps and responded with, with uh, curiosity about what this is all about. And I found hope in the words of Pastor Coley, who reminded us of what it is to walk in a time that is challenging. Jane Goodall would be the first to say to us, we live in challenging, difficult times. Um, and uh, because of those challenging, difficult times, one of the things we have faced as a congregation is, how do we uh, give hope or life to those who are in a situation very different from ours? And so one of the things you were invited to do was to respond to the Afghan refugees that came into the state of Wisconsin. And so I put a little announcement out 
and you responded with great generosity. I have taken three carloads, full packed carloads of stuff to a drop-off site for the, for the refugees because of you. And that gave me hope. But there's one thing that happened that was kind of the, the catalyst or the linchpin or the spark that really said, this is a place of hope and gives life to others. Here's what happened. On the first load that I took, my car was packed. The trunk was full, the back seat was full to the, to the ceiling, and the front, the front seat was also packed. Floors, seats, everything, jammed full of stuff. And so I'm unloading the stuff, and when I loaded, when I loaded my car, I didn't bother to look at, well, what's in this box and what's in this, I just didn't, I, I wasn't being too nosy. So, but I, I just packed it and took it down. So I'm unloading the stuff out of my car, and as I'm unloading, I'm trying to get it done quickly, um, a box fell on the ground. And so I didn't go back right away and get, get the box. because it was, My hands were already full. I went back, saw the box that I didn't even notice when I loaded it up, picked the box up, opened it up, and in it was several copies of the Quran, the holy book of, the, of those of the Muslim faith, as well as prayer rugs for people that practice their faith as they faced east five times a day to pray. And I stood and looked at it, and I was given great hope. Because people here in this place want to give life to others and step out of their comfort zone of what we normally practice in our faith to reach out and give hope and life to others. So I want to thank you for your generosity to those that have a different culture and faith uh, a tradition than we do. And I also want to tell you that your generosity. Our message this uh, year um, is because of you, our church plants seeds. And I wanted to mention that Mark is the chair of the Board of Mission and Outreach here at Grace. And what a great way to plant seeds, Mark. <clears throat> It's because of the generosity of the members of this congregation that seeds of faith are planted and faith is able to grow in people's lives. You will soon be receiving your pledge card for 2022. I ask you to prayerfully consider the amount that you are able to give to the church for the year ahead. Because of you, our church plants seeds. Thank you. Our offering. The Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King often spoke of people's need to be in community with one another. He once put it this way, I can never be what I ought to be until you are what you ought to be. You can never be what you ought to be until I am what I ought to be. The invitation to bring our tithes and pledges and offerings is an invitation to support one another, those within this community and beyond, to become all what we can call to be, our tithes, our pledges, both monetary and others, enable us to give thanks to God for the resources we have been given and enable that, enable us to become resources for others. As we give to this ministry, we help others become what they can be, and we become more of what we can be. Give generously and watch the miracles of God unfold in our lives and our ministry together.
Please pray with me. Thank you, O God, for the gifts of your people. Help us that we rely not on our own understanding in the use of these gifts, but to seek your wisdom, knowing that as we do, you will reveal and your people near and far will be blessed. Amen. Today is uh, Days of Elijah, which is a good one, especially on the refrain, um, for some instruments and those kinds of things. So we have some up front. Uh, if any of the children in our midst or any of those who are children at heart would like to come forward and grab an instrument, you are welcome to do so. courage, hold fast to that which is good, render unto no one evil for evil, strengthen the faint-hearted, support the weak, help the afflicted, honor everyone, love and serve the Lord your God, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. And now may the blessing of God Almighty, creator, redeemer, and sustainer of us all be with you and remain with you this day and forevermore. And all the people said, Amen. Amen.